Good morning, Southside Bible Church. Special welcome to our first time guests. Grateful to have you here with us to worship our God together. Um, One announcement I wanted to add on July 16th here at Southside at 7 p.m., Mitch McVicker is going to be doing a concert. He's a Dove Award writer and singer. He used to travel with Rich Mullins and he was in that car. I think he was driving it when it flipped and Rich. Uh, went into glory. And so he'll be here, but uh, one of the things I wanted to bring up, he's asked um, one of our local bands to open up for him, and it's our uh, very own Southside uh, band. Uh, It's called 828 from Romans 828, and they're going to be opening. And uh, Jordan is one of the singers, and he was in the uh, um, theater shooting in Aurora, and it's the 10-year anniversary, and so we're re- really wanting to evangelize and reach out, and I think the news is going to maybe uh, uh, publish that concert, and we want to invite all survivors and people who have been journeying that and just all the different um, shootings and things that have been going on and uh, just a time to outreach. So as we're going to look this morning, with a, we bring the gospel of good news to people. I want uh, as many who can come to be looking for people that Sunday night to meet and talk with. And so just be praying for that outreach and that God would use that in a mighty way to proclaim his gospel. Well, we are studying through the book of Romans. If you would turn to Romans chapter 10, I was going to finish up this chapter this morning, but I got stuck in verses 14 through 15. And I just felt led by God to lock in on this section this morning. It's just, it's so important to the church of God. It's, a, it's our foundation and I just, I, I see in Philippians that Paul calls us to have this fellowship, this koinonia together in the gospel. One of the things that binds us together is that we are one in Christ, but we want to take this gospel to as many as possible. We want those who are lost to be found, to come from the wrath of God to the pleasure and acceptance of God. And so I want us to, to be a, a church just united and locked. How do we work together to keep taking and lifting high the cross Of Christ, and that is really this section that we are in this morning. So let's go to our God and just ask Him to minister to every heart here. Father, I do, I I thank you for worship. I thank you that we can continue now to worship through the Word of God. I pray that you would be put on display for the way that you want this gospel to go to the nations, the way you want it to go across the street and into hearts that are sitting here even this morning. God, I pray that we would um, have minds that understand the way you do this and hearts and, and feet that would be glad to take this gospel all over to the ends of the earth. And so God, move in, in every heart. If there's one that just needs to share with a family member or someone who needs to go across the globe, um, Lord, move in every heart, guide and direct and show for your name's sake. In your glory, we pray this. Amen. Amen. Well, I was sitting and thinking this week. I don't do that very often. It felt good. Um, How much news we just get on a daily basis. Back in the old days when I was growing up, you had to get up every morning. I'd go up and grab this thing called a newspaper. And I would just sit. I I love that newspaper. It was weird. I love news. I I like the sports page. And when I could, I would watch the weather at night. But I've learned a couple things about news. Some news is a waste. Some news is amazing, like it's a girl. Some news is so piercing that Russia has invaded Ukraine. And some news is just glorious that we have to respond or, or do something with that news. Hurricane Katrina, catastrophic, it's coming. You need to evacuate. You need to respond to that news, and some didn't. Or news that says it's malignant. News that says you have an inheritance from your Aunt Betty. As we've been studying through Romans, the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God to bring people into the realm of salvation. It's not go out and work and try to accomplish and get God's favor as we just heard in those testimonies. It's news. It is to be received and it's to be believed. It's news from God. It's to be acted upon. We've learned in Romans that it's been two-part news. 
For three chapters, it was bad news. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. Jew, Gentile alike, moral, immoral, the eternal judgment of God is coming and it's on you. It's on you. That is bad news. Quit buying the lies. We're just good and God's happy with us. You come into this world, a spiritual stillborn with the wrath of God upon you. There's, that's bad news. That is not good news. And then Paul led us. He said, that bad news is I'm telling you it so you can hear the best news that you've ever heard. And it can mean something to you where you'll lose your life for this good news. The good news is God made a remedy for sinners under the wrath of God. God's son went up on a cross and received that wrath. He drained every last drop of it. He lived a righteousness in our place as a man that God required of us. It's received by faith in Christ alone, not by religion, not by morality, not by cleaning up. It never ceases to break my heart every time I sit down to share the gospel and the person across the table from me thinks religion or morality is the answer. And I hear it almost every time. And most of them grew up in the church. They need news. And what I've learned, you will not figure it out naturally. You will not just look at at the sun and the moon and stars and figure it out. You need special revelation. You need God's news, God's message. They need to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done to be saved. The good news of the gospel. I'm a news anchor. I've been bought with a great price. I'm a debtor to tell this news to all people. That is what we're going to look at this morning. I'm his ambassador. And so let's take it up where we left off last time we were in Romans before we were blessedly interrupted by our brother last week by the best Father's Day message I've heard in my life. Let's take it up. We looked at Romans 10 verses 11 through 13. We've been looking at a gospel that God God has designed all the way through Romans. And now in verse 11, the scripture says then, whoever believes in Jesus Christ will not be disappointed. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches, the riches of salvation and mercy for all who will call upon him. For all who will call, I'm desperate. I can't save myself. I need this salvation. I call upon it. And it's not just for Jews now anymore. As we just saw in our baptisms, it's, it's, it's now for all. And it's, it's, it's for Jew and Gentile. It's for whoever. And verse 13, will call upon the name of the Lord, will be saved. And so this gospel now is for everyone who knows they're 10,000 leagues under the sea and they cry to Jesus Christ as a savior and he will save all who will call on him. God is not looking for a few good men like the army used to, but the mercy of our God to the nations, it'll be for all who will call upon the name of the Lord. Paul has shown the narrowness of this gospel. It's only through Jesus Christ, and now the broadness of its scope, it is designed for the, for the nations, for anyone who will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so my question is, how are they going to call? How are they going to call? Does God just preach this message from heaven with a loudspeaker? Does he just zap them? They don't even know why, just mine. Does he send angels? What is the means that God's then going to use to dispense this beautiful salvation that we've been studying for three years? What is the means the answer should take up every believing heart this morning with your calling? God, how do you want to dispense this glorious gospel? And so it doesn't happen by osmosis. It doesn't even happen by prayer alone. God uses the message of Jesus Christ to save sinners, to to see the truth and call. God uses that message. He uses an earthly mouthpiece to declare what no human soul can figure out on their own. 
This is the means that God has chosen to take the best news in the world, his gospel, to the nations. This is the means. And I pray that as God has awakened some of your hearts to the gospel, I've been hearing again and again, I've been awakened to the glorious gospel through Romans. Would this morning be that he would awaken you now to your calling to share this gospel with all? Because all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's your calling. Are you awakened to it? Or is it your best kept secret? Dig, let's dig in. I've been praying, just awaken every one of us to this calling. I love this gospel. And don't just sit and say, That's, that is great news. I'm going to have Bible studies and talk about it till I die. And never share it with anybody. That's where we're going to go this morning. This is news. When, when you have good news, I struggle to keep it to myself. My, no one will tell me any secrets in my family. <laughs> I want to tell the news. How do we do it? Romans 10, 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? And just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. These could be some of the most important verses in the Bible. Very simple, that God spreads this gospel through the heralding of his people. The way they're going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord is, is through truth and hearing it. They can't call upon someone whom they have not heard of. When you're sitting in North Africa all alone, you didn't just call out into the blank sky. It's what she's been being taught her whole life about this God and this Christ, and she called upon him. The natural man will never get this. We live in a post-Christian nation but does not know the gospel. I just read from a, a pastor in, in the Boston area, two to 4% of, pe of people go to Christian church in New York, Boston area. Two to 4%. And I don't even know what they define as a Christian church. We've grown up in evangelical churches and I meet with people weekly who have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've never heard what is justification by faith in Christ alone. I don't even know what you're talking about. We live in a world that's dying without the word of Jesus Christ and preaching is the means, sharing. James 1.18 says, in the exercise of his will, God, he brought us forth by the word of truth. He, he brings you forth. He gives life by you hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's his means. That's his instrument. Say, Lazarus, Come forth, the word of God preached. So what I want to do this morning is take this chain. We got another chain. I think this one's still up here. I'm not going to get it though. That Paul has put together for us to establish missions and evangelism. And I want to look at each part of this chain. The first one, how then shall they call upon him, Jesus, in whom they have not believed? How then, how can a Jew or Gentile, a uh, whoever, call upon the name of the Lord? What brings a man or woman or child into this whoever? How do I get into the whoever? How can they call upon Christ then in whom they have not believed? To call upon is a, it's a desperation. You're calling out to Jesus as a savior. Deliver me, save me. I'm calling out to you. And if you do not believe in who Christ is and what he has done, how can you call upon him to save you? You never will. The world is full of people calling upon little g God for help. And they're foxhole Christians. Whenever they're in trouble, they call. They call all the time. Help me. Get me out of this. Uh, I, I remember 9-11 uh, when all the presidents gathered together to pray for our nation. And, and most of them are God haters. And we call upon God in national tragedy. How can we truly call upon God in a way that brings you into salvation? This is a calling that believes the news. 
This is a calling upon, God, help me. Rescue me from my sin and the wrath that is upon me. God, rescue me. I'm desperate. I believe in the one who has remedied this problem. I'm calling upon the one whom I believe is able to save me. I'm like the thief on the cross. Remember me today in paradise, Jesus. I need to be saved. I need you to rescue me. I'm going to call on you. I see him suffering in my place, standing in my stead, bearing the wrath of God for me. I see his righteousness being the righteousness that God requires of me and him giving it to me. I see that he is able. God, you're able and you have outstretched arms. And I believe, so I, I call upon him. It comes out of faith. The calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ does not happen in a vacuum. It's based on the understanding of the gospel, the truth of what we've been studying in Romans. There has to be intellectual belief and content to call on Jesus. How can you call upon a Savior you don't know as a Savior? James Montgomery Boyce said, intellectual understanding without commitment is not true faith but neither is commitment without intellectual understanding. Henry Ironside, the pastor at Moody Church in Chicago, said a flamboyant evangelist named Gypsy Smith came to town, giving a message all about his fascinating gypsy stories. <clears throat> at the end of the meeting, Gypsy Smith gave an altar call, and hundreds of people surged forward. And Ironside wondered if they were coming forward because they wanted to be gypsies. What are you responding to? The gospel of Jesus Christ, the truth. You can't call upon someone you don't believe in. Doesn't that give you a burden that the nations are out there and they, they can't call on someone they don't believe, they don't know about? They got to hear it. It implies this epigenosis that we've been learning in this section, this full knowledge of understanding the gospel. The second link in the chain. Then how then shall they believe in whom they have not heard? You can't believe in Christ and his work then unless you hear. News has to be shared. Billions of people are dying without Jesus Christ and they can't believe unless they hear. They've got to hear the truth. This is why there's missions and this is why there's evangelism. They have to hear. Churches struggle with, with unity uh, when they're ingrown. The, the frozen chosen fight. You must hear the truth if you're going to believe in it. Hearing is absolutely essential. This establishes our responsibility and our mandate. They've got to hear. This word is used 500 times in the Bible. Acts 2.37, when they heard this, the gospel, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do to be saved? They heard it. Acts 13, 48, when the Gentiles heard this message, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as been appointed to eternal life believed. Colossians 1, 5, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard, and the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world, and it's constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you since the day you heard of it and understood the God of grace and truth. And so this message has to be heard in truth. And then the third link in the chain is how shall they hear then without a preacher? How are they going to hear about Christ unless somebody proclaims him to them? Here is the call to preaching. And this word here for preacher, it's a participle, which is a verbal noun, and it can be translated this one. How are they going to hear without a preaching one, without one who's, who's preaching? And so I don't think it's just the office, but it's, it's the means itself. How are they going to hear without someone preaching Jesus? So all of us this morning, you're not off the hook. Let the preachers do it. Yes, but you're the preaching one. How are they going to hear unless you're telling them this truth and this message of the gospel? You are called to share the news. This is a great word. It means to herald, announce, publish, make known everywhere. 
How are they going to call upon the Lord unless we publish it by our lives and the truth and we herald it and we make it known to everyone? Here's our mandate. Here's our purpose. William Carey's mission was simple. I want to know Christ and to make him known. I want to know this Christ and I want to make him known. I want to preach him. I want to proclaim him. I want to show him by my life and deeds. And so we as a church should be seeking to make this message known, to preach it, to publish it from every avenue, every venue that we can. Why? Because he says it brings salvation. It gets you out from under the wrath of God and brings you into grace with the favor and acceptance of your God. That's why we preach it. It's the only way to get wrath off of you. If you're sitting here this morning thinking you got God's wrath off of you through any other way than Jesus Christ crucified, you need news. You need news this morning. The message of the preacher is call upon him in whom we have believed. Believe in him, Jesus Christ. Just keep preaching him and sharing him again and again. I've come to so many deathbeds with people who aren't believers just whispering, call on Jesus, call on Jesus. Thief on, the thief on the cross, please. Just, I, I can't, they usually can't understand a lot. Just call to Jesus to save you. Just keep proclaiming him anywhere and everywhere. Spurgeon said, keep hitting that nail, Jesus Christ, till it gets in. Just keep preaching, proclaiming, sharing, trying again until God drives it into their heart and they confess with their mouth, Jesus is Lord. There's no salvation in anyone else but him. There's no other name under heaven by which a man can be saved. And so we get this message out because they can't believe unless someone's a preaching one. They just can't get this by looking at natural revelation. We need people to come share the truth of this gospel that has set me free and changed my life. Fourth link, how shall they preach then unless they're sent? Just sitting around talking about it will not get this done. And I'll tell you this, we need to understand it. We need to live into the gospel. So we should be studying it. We should be trying to get it from all angles of our life. But if all we do is study it and talk about it, you've missed it. I believe it, therefore I speak. And I share this gospel and I find ways to proclaim it. I had a young man say to me, my biggest regret of high school is the opportunity that I had to proclaim Jesus Christ and I squandered it in the pursuit of popularity. We've been given our marching orders from Christ our captain to go into all the world and preach this gospel because it saves. In Acts 1.8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Holy Spirit's gonna empower you to be a witness of Jesus Christ and to testify him into where you live to out to the ends of the earth. What a gift. Go, Jesus said. Go to the highways and byways, compel them to come in. How are, how are they going to preach unless they're sent? This is the call then to send out missionaries, preachers of the gospel right here to the remotest part of the earth. It's a passive voice. I like it. It's God who sends out. Matthew 10, he says, I send you out. Galatians 1.15, but when he who had set me apart, God, Paul's writing, even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. And so the church, we see Paul and Barnabas being sent out by the church to herald this news. Elders would lay hands on them and, and pray. And so we're, we are now moving into more of, of the official and the office and sending people out to plant churches and to, to preach and spread this gospel. And so preaching is such an important thing. And so I can't tell you this, you got to preach the right gospel. You got to know it. So Paul wrote this epistle and said, my gospel, God's gospel, Jesus gospel, they're all the same. 
And so we got to know this word. We got to know the right gospel if we're going to go out and lift it up and say, believe this and be saved. And so what I've seen in my little journey, there's too many who are self-appointed preachers. And churches, it's like the book of Judges. Everybody just does what is right in their own eyes. I, I want to go start a church in Cambodia, so I just did it. You get a warm feeling in your stomach. I'm called to start a church. I'm going. And then you, you start a church without being sent by God or by the church. I had a guy come to me. He said, I started a church because I had a burden for real, true singing. Have you been trained to preach God's word, to say, thus saith the Lord? And when you say, thus saith the Lord, it is what he says. I, I just want us to have an hour of good worship. Let the church confirm your call. Is Rodney still here? Let the church confirm your call. I just can't drive this home enough that you let God raise you up and have a body that sees and knows and observes these gifts and don't be self-appointed. I get the joy of talking open and honest with our missionaries and they are battle-worn because it's one of the hardest things you're ever gonna do in your life. This is not for those who think missions is exciting. Don't run without being called and without being sent. Paul says, who is sufficient for these things? And so our responsibility as a church is to equip them and send them out and make sure that they've been, they're ready. And Matthew 9, 38, therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Unreached peoples must hear the gospel and we have to sacrifice to send God's messengers to them. And we got a message coming up in the next uh, month, how we take care of them when they are on the field. And so we, we need to be sent. So we got the official sending and we also, every one of you are sent by God to go be a herald of this truth and wherever he sends you and wherever you go this week. And so this is the way, how are they going to call upon the name of the Lord unless they hear and we're sent and we go into this world and we enter into it with this message. We must take it to our own Jerusalem. And then Paul's going to close with one last quote in Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. It's interesting what Isaiah says here. I've had people tell me that the, the gospel's not very applicable. I don't get it, but I just want to give you a little practical help this morning. I think some of the two biggest things that our nation struggles with is the pursuit of riches and the pursuit of beauty. And last time we were together in Romans, he says, all who call, uh, he will abound in riches for everyone who calls upon him. And, and we laughed at all these billionaires who have nothing. And we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's all been settled for me. I, I, I quote it too much, but I'm going to do it again. Hudson Taylor, Inland China miss, Mission, sitting there, and his wife goes, Hudson, how much money do we have? With, I think it was five children. And he just smiled. 25 cents and all the promises of God. <laughs> don't you want to live that way? I don't want to quote that. I want to live that way. And I just, I have every rich, I got everything in Christ Jesus. I, I don't have to spend all my time getting the riches of this world. I've been set free. I'm rich. And then the other thing I see in th this country is beauty. It's, it's just, everything's built on that. We live in a nation that body beautiful. There, there's a pressure like no other on this issue. There's so much available, so much money. You could work the rest of your days just to invest in keeping your body beautiful. And you will lose. You spend millions of dollars and you're going to lose. And it can become all consuming. And we live in the middle of this culture and it brings eating disorders, body shaming, depression. I've seen suicide come from this mindset. And Paul says, don't be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed. Be renewed. Begin thinking God's thoughts about beauty. Everything, the kingdom of God, is the opposite of what this world says. And I want to set you free this morning. You're rich, abundantly rich, and you are beautiful because you're clothed in the righteous garment of Jesus Christ. The freedom that I have for you this morning 
is it breaks my heart to watch people wearing the garment of Jesus Christ and taking this world's view of beauty and chasing it like a dog chasing its tail and being consumed by it and it kills your sanity. It drives you crazy. We have a a term for it in our world. We've even come up with our own term. The world did this for us. Midlife crisis. The battle of the glory of youth fading, where the Bible says it's beautiful. You're growing in wisdom and godliness. Gray hair is to be honored. Uh, Nike fellowships, praise the Lord. And, and, And you're fighting it. And your greatest fear is to not be attractive in this world's standards. And I know some wives who just sit there trembling, like I'm losing it. And is my husband going to keep loving me? It's, this isn't a joke. This is killing people. I see it all the time. I'm going to give you a better definition of beauty, and then I'll finish this passage. It costs nothing. This beauty is free, but it costs God his own son's life. And for beauty, there's a garment called the righteousness of Jesus Christ that he has wrapped you in. And God looks at you and he rejoices over you. The beauty of you standing in the presence of God right now, get excited about how beautiful you are. And then he's going to say, and you want real beauty? The feet that bring the gospel to other people. Wouldn't you love to be a couple? A beauty to you how do we spread this gospel till we breathe our last? You want unity? You you know what? You can get old, lose your hair, get fat. You can do whatever you want. And you're unified and saying, I want to take my feet and spread this gospel to anywhere and everywhere. That's beauty. That's beautiful. Your spouse is going to watch you laying there on a deathbed one day going, that's beauty. That man, that woman gave their lives to Jesus Christ and this message Instead of this world where you got to keep fearing it and buying more things and pumping more things up and doing all that stuff, here is true beauty. Be free. Quit believing the lies of this world. I want to set everyone free this morning. What true beauty is, we don't fit in this world. We're aliens and strangers. We can be so different and set apart. My wife made a covenant with another lady in this church we will use nothing on our wrinkles and we're just going to do it. Beautiful. Beautiful. Here Paul's telling us what true beauty is. And so teenagers, oh, I want you to hear this so you don't spend all these awkward years just, I look this way, my nose is too big, just being consumed with what you look like. I want you to be free this morning. I think some of the most beautiful people in our church are going through chemo and, and they're bald and they're and, uh, rejoicing in Jesus. There's a beauty like nothing else I've ever seen. Or those big babies sticking out and you look like a pear. <laughs> and you're bringing a new life into the world. That's beautiful. And so 40, 50, 60 year olds decaying and fearing it be set free. This is funny. What's the, probably the ugliest thing about you? What is your least favorite body part? Most often, nose or feet? Feet. I, I think I said it wrong. Laura was teaching me this morning. Let me remember now. What? Pan, pedicure. Pedicure. I think I said manicure last time, and that's fingers. You can tell I do these. <laughs> You can get pedicures till the cows come home and you can still look at those feet and go, they're, they're ugly. But they got these funny little dimples in your big toe and it's bigger than your second toe. And you can go on and on. Feet are usually not beautiful. And Paul takes beauty and he ties it to your feet this morning. And it's the one who comes bringing good news to other people of Jesus Christ with those feet. Beautiful feet. They're lovely. That's beauty. Go tell people about Jesus Christ. There's nothing more beautiful than someone doing that. <clears throat> I was in a coffee shop yesterday, and the lady next to me at the table was preaching the gospel to the lady next to her, and I was just smiling, going, That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So, what's cool 
The image here is, is when there was a battle that had to be fought with a nation. The king would go out with the army and they would go fight. And however, uh, the results of the battle, they weren't posted on Facebook or Twitter or CNN or Fox. You, you had to get a runner who would come back and he would announce the results of how the battle is going. And the watchmen would look intently for the appearance of the runner with the results of the battle. Can you imagine how on edge you are waiting to find out? Are we being conquered or not? What is going to happen? What? I can't imagine what that would feel like. And so that's the term. And the watchmen would shout out the news to the people and say, we won. We defeated them. And everyone would go crazy. We get a, our, our nation has been preserved, our little town. And so salvation from earthly enemies was good news. But you take a message of deliverance from a greater bondage, a greater enemy, sin, sin. And there's a message that you get to go tell. There's a way to be delivered from sin and the wrath of God that's upon you. What a, what a, I get to be the footman to go tell this news. Best job in the world that we've been called to. Here comes the messenger with a little white flag. The war and the enmity with God over. God raised Jesus from the dead. The enmity is over now when you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The war with God has ended. Believe in his son Call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. How lovely are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. That's beauty. Give your life to that and quit listening to the lies of this world and being in bondage that you don't even share the gospel because you feel so lack of beauty. You feel unworthy. Please be free to be the most beautiful person that tells of this gospel. And so we come proclaiming news, peace and happiness that our God reigns. And so how are they gonna know that they can have peace with God unless we're sent, unless we're preaching ones, unless I believe all are to go to the places that God has sent you, all of us, to herald this? How can they call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? unless we're sent. And I close out with an illustration. I, I had several, and this one I keep coming back to. But Donald Gray Barnhouse heard a story from a missionary in Western Africa, and it just captures what I want to say, and we'll, we'll pray. There was a man who had a disease known as elephantitis. And that's where your skin becomes thick and hard, and the limbs become enormously large. And they can become 12 to 15 inches in diameter, your, your feet. That's a very painful thing. And he writes, this poor victim of elephantitis became a radiant Christian. And he could do nothing other than tell people of the grace of God, which he had shown in sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die for them. He lived in an African village and determined that every soul in that village should hear the good news of salvation. And it was extremely difficult for him to walk with those monstrous legs which bore him about but he thought nothing of the pain and he toiled on from hut to hut to tell those who dwelt there about the Savior who had come into his life. And each evening he would return to his own hut where he was maintained by the kindness of his relatives. And at the end of several months, he was able to tell the missionary that he had visited every hut in the village and that he was now starting to take the gospel message to a village that was about two miles away. And each morning he would start out painfully and he'd walk the two miles to that village and go from hut to hut with the gospel and return the two miles before sundown to his own hut. And finally there came the day when he had visited every hut in the neighboring village. His work being done in these two villages, he remained at home for some weeks, but began to become more and more restless. He spoke to the pastor and to the missionary who was a medical doctor about a village that lay 10 or 12 miles through the jungle and asked if the gospel was being taken to that village. And as a boy, before he'd been afflicted, he used to travel the jungle path to that village and he remembered that it was a large village and that there were many people there. And he knew that they needed the good tidings of the Savior. And he was advised not to think of going to that village, but day after day, the burden just kept growing in this man. 
And one day his family came to the missionary and said that the man had disappeared before dawn and that they heard him go, but supposed that he was just going away for a moment. And he didn't return and the family became very concerned about this man. And afterwards, the full story became known. He started down the path toward the distant village. Step after weary step, he dragged his leathery legs and gigantic feet along the path that led to his goal. The people of the village later told how he had come to them when he was already noon, when it was already noon. His feet were further swollen, bruised, and bleeding. He had been forced to stop and rest again and again, and it was already past midday when he came. They offered him food, but before he would eat, he began to tell the people about Jesus Christ. Up and down the village he went, every to the, to the, even to the very least hut, last hut, telling them that the God of all creation was love and that he had sent his only son to die that their sins might be removed. He told how the Lord Jesus had been raised from the dead and had come into his heart, transforming him, bringing more joy and peace than he could have ever hoped or dreamed. There was no shelter for him in that village. And even though the sun was low, he started on his way down the jungle path toward home. The darkness of Africa is a terrible darkness. And the night can bring forth many creatures from the jungle. The sun went down and the poor man dragged himself along the path in the darkness, guided by some insight, which kept him from going astray. He told his pastor later that his fear of the night and the animals which had come upon him was more than balanced by the joy that he had in his heart as he realized that he had told the whole village about the Lord Jesus Christ. Toward midnight, the missionary doctor was awakened by a noise on his front porch. He listened, but all seemed still. Somehow he couldn't go back to sleep, and he went to the door with a light to see what had caused the noise. He recognized at once that the poor neighbor had returned to the village from his long trip and had come with this wounded and bleeding leg stumps to the door of the dispensary. The missionary called his helpers and they lifted the man, almost unconscious, and put him on one of the beds in the little hospital. The doctor said that he had seldom seen such a frightful sight as he looked upon those bleeding feet which had come back from such an errand of love and mercy. Unashamedly, the doctor told how he bent over those feet to minister to them, and as he cleaned and dressed them, he told them how his own tears began to fall and become the ointment upon them. The doctor ended the story by saying, in all my life, I do not know when my heart was more drawn out to another Christian believer. All I could think of was the verse in the word of God, how beautiful are the feet of them that bring good tidings that publish peace. He couldn't get over the beauty of what he was looking at. The feet that brought the glad tidings of good things. And I pray that that would sink into our hearts and that our feet would be beautiful Please care that this is how God dispenses his mercy to the world. May we give our lives to this message, to every life we can touch with it until he comes back or calls us home. And let that be what unites our hearts as in Philippians. And I, I have a brother who can't come to church anymore. He's on dialysis. And he just prays for every prayer request, any meetings, for this church. I think there are many of you who have been baptized in this church because of his effective prayers at home praying. And so whatever your condition, we're, we're a team to lift high the cross of Christ because anyone who calls upon that name will be saved from the wrath of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for such a gospel. I thank you for your son's willingness to depart glory and come and be rejected and killed on a cross, bear your wrath, drain that whole cup in our place, live the perfect life in our place. God, what a gospel that brings peace with God. I thank you for this and that it doesn't come by our works and it just comes by an empty hand by one who calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and is saved. God, it's a gospel that you have designed for the, whole, for the world. You've designed for any who will call from this place to Jesus Christ. It will always be answered and they will be saved. So God, let us as a church 
give our lives to true beauty, to lift up the beautiful one, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to have feet that will travel and go wherever you ask us to, to proclaim this beautiful Savior. God, I pray that everyone in this church would have beautiful feet and would tell of the beautiful Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in that precious, beautiful name that we do pray. And all God's people said,